Okay. There we go. <laughs> so good. I'm pumped. Let's do it. <laughs> That's how you're supposed to start. Like That's right. Our events. Yeah, I must feel like I'm not, I'm not trouble following that up, but I'll uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> All right. In theory, you should be able to share and take over and do what you need to do. Let me know if you yeah. cannot. Anything you want to you want to preface the chapter? Oh, with? so I guess uh, not for the chapter in particular, but um, next week, uh, Max and Julia both are going to join us for a Q and A. So we're going to do like a review of. Um, well, we were slated to do a review of chapters four through nine, and Max me and was like hey do you guys want to do a q a instead it's like yeah so um yeah so have questions ready next week and i'll start trying to collect some but it'll probably be a little bit more like a normal meeting than the headly things have been we'll see how crowded it gets um so yeah uh next week no one has to prep <laughs> that's me thank god <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Although I feel like I feel like as a group we would have so many more questions after ten, but that's okay. So yeah, nine is the end of like part two of or the basics section of the book. Yeah. So, um, and then probably again at some point we'll talk to them. Um, Fourteen isn't really an end it's just where they've gotten so far so that's the other thing is we need to kind of put some things interspersed because we're going to run out of book pretty soon before we actually get to the end of the book um yeah yeah okay all right so that's all i have um so yeah the week after next uh osma is ready to do chapter 10 we will need someone for chapter 11, but there's no rush on that. Um, and other than that, we are ready to talk about chapter nine, judging model effectiveness. Take it away. Yeah, so John's got some great learning objectives here. I don't think I'm gonna hit all of these, but I'll, I'll hit what I can and we can we can go back to the book um, for, the, for the other ones. The, the meat of this chapter is is the yardstick package, and it there's there's like one good example, and once you kind of realize what the inputs are, then you can kind of do it over and over again for all the different metrics. So I'm going to kind of take it a little a little different direction. Um, I, I guess I, I see two I see two ways this could go. So you know, I definitely let me know what you guys want to talk about because uh, I'm flexible. So. The, the main point is to explain why measures of model fit of actual data are important, even for purely inferential models. And I think that uh, they do a really good job with this in the book about, you know, emphasizing how the tidy models package is, is really focused on empirical validation, which is a, a quantitative approach to estimating effectiveness. All that really means is we've made a model and instead of just looking at it to say, okay, well, the points look like they're close to the, the expected values, and that's pretty good. We can actually quantify exactly how good it is and use that compare, use that um, you know, specific number to compare models, to compare different versions of the same models, to compare models to each other. And so there's a whole bunch of, of good reasons to, uh, to have a quantitative approach like this. Um, they give a really good example in the chapter of, of you know, a potential medical study and, and how uh, you know, the results of the model were, were only marginally better than, than just uh, you know, what, what the uh, null model would be, or you know, if you were just predicted based on the, the class probabilities, I think. Um, and so this was really uh, the, the, the two points that I wanted to focus on. Uh, you know, just because you've optimized the statistical characteristics of a model does not imply that the model fits well. Like for back in, in their example in the book, um, let me pull it up real quick. There was a, 
you know, the, the, the accuracy of their model was about 73.3%, but it was a poor model, it was a poor measure of model performance because uh, the, the baseline rate was 72.7%. And so what they really focuses on is, is the choice of which metrics to use can be critical. And that's kind of where I think I can, can maybe add some value to this chapter. Uh, there's this really cool plot that, that they have in the book where the, here is the same model optimized two different ways. Um, for root mean squared error on the left and for R squared on the right. And you can see how, while these are really correlated together, they, there are larger gaps at the top and the bottom at the tails versus root mean squared error. It you know, has larger um, errors throughout, but are more uh, you know, in line with, with the, the predicted. And so these are you know, two totally different ways of, of optimizing the model. And what I want to do was, hey, let's take all of the different uh, metrics that Yardstick has and see what it looks like for uh, you know all these different models. So uh, I know that we love memes in this chat, so I did my best to make a meme. Um, you know, the examples here are are to to demonstrate the metric evaluation. This is not how I would do data science. This is not like uh, the the training test set. This is not a good example of feature selection. This is just for for metric valuation. Um, I, I found that my I try to do this, and and my examples do not like look like they do in in the tidy model book. So, um, stick with me a little bit. Part of this discussion can be maybe how I could better, uh, you know, create the models to to show that, and, and why I didn't really get the same results that that they did in this this really cool plot. Uh, so, yeah. Any questions before I kind of get in? I, I really want to talk about you know what all the the yardstick package has to offer. Pan is good. Uh, okay, so just to kind of show you what I did, you know, loaded in the data, um, or we're using Ames data, and you know I needed a factor budget, so I just kind of picked a random threshold. So the, the two things we want to look at are regression metrics and then uh, like a binary classification metric. So I kind of created a budget that say we wanted to buy a house for less than one hundred and sixty thousand dollars with a binary uh, one or zero if it's if it's under our budget or not. Um, I'm going to get into a few things that we haven't touched yet in the book, and so we can kind of skim past them. I don't want to steal anybody's thunder who's who's presenting later, but I had to use a little bit of stuff that we haven't got to yet. Um, but up here at the top, this is going to be kind of a good review for for the stuff we we worked on last week with the workflows. So uh, the the cross field validation, I, I created a recipe. I picked you know five or six random uh, random variables from Ames, and I, I used the step dummy to uh, uh, categorize the categorical variables. Um, created a specification. This is the new part, this tune function. And so instead of just saying, here's the penalty I want to use, here's the mixture I want to use for this for this lasso regression, uh, what I did is, is you, you tell tidy models, we're going to search for a range of these. And uh, we're going to get more into that in the future. I put it all together with a workflow, add recipe, add model. And then this is kind of where that, that tune comes into play. So what I want to do is pick the best model for all of these different metrics. And so in the book, it talks about how to make a metric set. Uh, you know, part of the yardstick package is where you can take each of these individual metrics and put them into a set. And so you can you can evaluate a whole bunch of metrics at once. Um, I picked all of the all of the ones that were used for regression, and I said, okay, let's capture all these metrics on our model uh, for just a, a range of, of penalties and mixtures. Um, so, will someone let me know if I need to, to check the chat? I'll let you know. It's, cool. You can. You're good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and so, this is this is kind of one direction. I think you know we could we could spend a lot of time on if if we wanted to. Uh, I, I think it plays back to some of the the things we talked about earlier in the book where. There's a lot of value in having predictable outputs to all of these these tidy model functions, and so I was kind of able to create uh, some cool map functions to to uh, pull a lot of different models into into one data frame. And so, 
uh, you know, just at the top here, I've, I've got just a, a vector of all the different um, metrics. And this select best is a, is a function we'll get familiar with later, but out of all of the samples that we fit here. And so there's eight different um, combinations of, of penalty and mixture. Uh, which one is the best for each of these particular metrics? And this was kind of my, this is my attempt at saying, uh, this, is a this is a model optimized for RMSE, this is a model optimized for R squared, but looking at it for, for every single one of these metrics. And so you select the best, then you, you redo the workflow with, with the best model. And so what, what this has done is it said, um, a mixture of this and a penalty of this is the best model for RMSE. And then it does that for each of these metrics. And then you, you refinalize the workflow, fit the model again. And um, I, I kind of pulled out the predictions. And so this is, this is something where uh, we haven't quite seen it yet. And so if you want to stop and talk about this, I think that's it's kind of a cool way to use tidy models. I agree that it's cool. I think uh, everyone's probably kind of absorbing, especially yeah. since you, you're giving us a little bit of a preview. Um, but in a good way. Yeah, that's cool. It's definitely a, a kind of a, a good uh, beginning to end. Here's everything we've learned and a little bit of a preview. So uh, what I'm pulling out of here is, is basically a metric name, all these different metrics, the best model and what the, what the predicted values are. And so it's all nested in here. I can go into to R later and, and show you how it, work, how it looks. But uh, you know, for now, I'll, uh, I'll show you what all the plots look like. So my, my, my goal is to recreate the plot that I had in the book um, with all these different metrics. <laughs> my problem is, despite the fact that many of the metrics picked different values of, of mixture and penalty, the predictions all look very, very much the same. Um, <laughs> so I guess, you know, a good thing to talk about here is, you know, I, I just put a little blurb of, uh, you know, why might you want to use this metric? And so what the chapter doesn't get at is there are a whole lot of um, regression metrics that are available in, in Yardstick. And if you don't go and look at the, the index, you might not know what's here. You, you might just default to the thing that you know, which is, you know, I, I've always used R squared. I've always been told to use root mean squared error. And so this is just kind of a, a good time. We're reading the book. This is on the, on the focus on the yardstick chapter, just to go look at what it has available. And, and I think just from personal experience, um, you know, we talk a lot about how most of data science is, is spent in, in data cleaning and feature engineering, uh, you know, a, a little bit of time spent on picking the right regression metric or the right classification metric can go a long way down the line. I've definitely spent a long time, you know, trying to fit models on the wrong metric. And then when I realized, okay, if I'd spent more time on this in the beginning, uh, I, I, I might have gotten to the solution a little faster. And so... I, yeah, I think this, this thing, this visualization is going to be super useful. I'm extremely skeptical right now because it looks like they're all exactly the same model. It is, and so I, I can, I can I think, show you. I mean, there's something not quite right. Like, oh, except there are, huh. There, there are different, and I, I can show you in, in, in R that it, it did pick different values, and so I'm not sure. But did it? Not picking different coefficients? I, yeah, I'm definitely interested in hearing how. But, yeah, else tune because tune should be tweaking your hyperparameters, but it's not necessarily. I mean, but if it has different hyperparameters, it should be different. I don't know. Um, I'd have to look at your the code a little. You know, take a lot more time to look at it than we want to probably do here. Yeah. But I love the walking through each one with a little description of when to use it. That's really cool. Yeah, so you know, uh, a little shout out to to Tan because he had to deal with with <laughs> all of the the very poor plots I sent him and, and, and kind of kept me on the right track. But you know, one thing we talked about was is you know I you 
you kind of get told early on, okay, well, you should always use R squared or something. And so just to kind of say, you know, here's when you want to use R squared. It's, it's a good measure for consistency and correlation, but not an accuracy metric. So I've got a, a bunch of good references up here on, on when to use which metrics, but you know, the idea behind R squared is it's, it's not really going to tell you how far off your model is from the predicted values. It, the, uh, you know, the good part of R squared, there's an R squared, there's a traditional R squared, which isn't really bounded between zero and one, but it's, it's very interpretable. You know, you could, you could tell this to almost any data scientist, they would know, you know, about how accurate your model is. They might not know how accurate it is in context of your domain, but, you, you know, you can tell it to anybody and, and they would have a good idea of, of, of how accurate your model is. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm saying accuracy, how, you know, how much it's correlated with, with the, the expected values. Um, there's a whole other set of metrics that are, are really more focused on accuracy. And so things like root mean squared error are going to say, you know, here is how far off my predicted value is from the actual value and measuring that gap between that, that prediction and, and, uh, and the actual, um, where root mean squared error really shines is, is where you want to reduce really large errors. And so, you know, what I kind of want to see in this plot was, uh, you know, fewer really large errors because, you know, let's say we're, we're trying to predict home values here. Maybe if your prediction is $10,000 off, um, that's not so bad. But if it's $20,000 off, that's more than twice as bad. And so that's where root mean squared error really shines is uh, you don't want to have really large errors. Um, kind of on the flip side, we've got uh, mean absolute error. I didn't want to write all these out. Um, but, but that's where, you know, I just talked through an example where uh, a $10,000 error in, in house prices, you know, might not, you know, is, is as bad as a, as a $20,000. I mean, not as bad, but to the same scale. It's, it's half as bad as a $20,000 error. And so that's really more concerned on the volume. And so those are two different kind of classes of how far off is my prediction from my, from my actual. Um, there, you know, the, the downside there is, you know, these are in the units of, of, uh, of, of the thing that you're measuring. And so we've got log scales here. If I, if I scale down, we've got the, the predicted scale price of log on the y-axis and the, the sale price uh, log 10 on the, on the x-axis. Um, but if, if we were talking in terms of, of the, you know, of the prices themselves, and I told you, you know, this, this model on average is $10,000 off the, the, the actual price. Well, you might really not know what that means if you don't know the, the range of the data in the, in the, in the data set, or it's not applicable to a model outside of this, you know, $10,000 might not be a big deal here when we're talking about houses, but it's, it's a terrible error for, for temperature. You, you, know, you can't be 10,000 degrees or whatever off, you know, it, it, it really depends on the, on the domain. And so uh, I'm out of breath. I'm gonna take a, take a second to pause and, and see if anybody has any questions or if you wanna talk about this a little bit more. I, something has to be wrong in the code. I still think <laughs> like only one of them is at all different and Honestly, that one could just be like it's it's off in the same way. Yeah. Like so, I don't know yet. Um, there is a lot to dive into here, but something feels off. I, I don't I know if anyone to... sees. Like, Honor had a question about um, RMSE that I think would be interesting to talk about too. Yeah, does someone, want to, does someone want to read it or I can find it in the chat? It's the last thing in the chat right now. Oh. Trying to read code. <laughs> <laughs> I see John's busy. Can you expect higher RMSE in general for higher priced homes, i.e. like 3 million plus? Um, it, would it be better to use percentage error term if that's the case? Yeah, and so th this kind of gets back to, to that business question where, I mean, I put my work hat on. Um, <laughs> uh, if you want to create a model that is, is very sensitive to large errors. Root mean squared error is, you know, is a reason that it's kind of the go-to metric of choice a lot of times. 
Um, if you are not, you know, any more concerned than you should be about a $3 million error, I guess the question is more about higher price homes in general. I, I think if the, you know, if, if the, the standard deviation, if, if, the, if the model is more wrong at higher prices, then you, you might need to transform the data. Like we, we've already took the log of the price and, and that, that might mitigate that somewhat. Does anybody have any other, any thoughts on this? I, I am not units. Oh, oh man, I just noticed that I don't think we were recording. <laughs> it said recording pause. I don't know how that happened. I'll bet it was the YouTube thing. Mm. Damn it. Well, I'll do it again. Yeah. <laughs> it'll, so be start your... second, it'll be better the second time around. <laughs> That's really aggravating. Well, um, hello, anyone trying to catch up? Go read his <laughs> notes. Sorry um, about that. So and, you know, one reason you might want to to look at it on transform scale, if you're looking at the residuals of your predictions, for example, and you did a transformation, then when, if you looked at the residuals on the original scale, then it might look like there is some pattern uh, that actually isn't there because of the transformation. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So, <laughs> you, in fact, what you might see is some of the times when you're plotting residuals, I know that one of the patterns you're looking for is if, you know, if, if you see that funnel, right? It's, it's narrow and it grows wider and wider and wider. You might need to, to log transform your data. Looking at the residuals might show you that, okay, you need to log transform your data, but you actually already did that. You're just looking at the data on the, on the original units. Possible wants to go over the multi-class example. I am I'm happy to walk through this. Um, to the to the best of my ability. What I think they're showing here is a lot of the the metrics that we just used for the binary. Oops, I lost it. Binary classification are also useful for the. I can't even get back to the right tab for the for the multi class, but they need to be adjusted a little bit because you know in a two class example, you're either you know things like accuracy or precision, or, or did you get the right class, yes or no. But when you're looking at two other classes, what I, what I think happens is you pool them to say, okay, well, this is the correct event versus the you know, other two classes are kind of pooled as the you know, incorrect event. Did I get it wrong in either of the other two classes? Not did I get it wrong in class X or class Y? Um, and so they kind of walk through some, some calculations here where you know, of the, the total, you know, whether it's the, the, these four classes and how many are in each, um, what is the percent, I guess this, this is the weights, so we, the percent of, of the total, so how many of, of the total uh, sample are this class of that class, and I think that, you know, what they're showing us is here's the, the sensitivities versus one versus all. Um, not just is it is VF to VF, is it, you know, did I get it wrong and predict F, M, or L? Uh, and, and so not just saying one or zero, but is it any of these other three classes? And I think the, the really cool part is they showed us how to do this in, you know, in the tidyverse and then showed, okay, well, actually we can just do the same thing with the the functions we've already worked with, sensitivity, uh, specificity, or the, the issue of sensitivity here, but uh, they will work in in yardstick and, and do these calculations that we saw here in the in the tidyverse, uh, kind of behind the scenes. So it's always good to know, you know here's exactly the math that they're doing, and and you'll see the exact same answers here when you when you feed the the functions into uh, the yardstick functions. And so just to kind of 
go over real quick what these what the inputs are here for for yardstick. Basically, you're feeding in you know this this two class example here. It's it's just whether it's class one or class two, and you've got a truth function and estimate function, and it's just comparing um, the the actual values to what your predicted values were. And so those are really the only three uh, inputs you need to know for, for most of them. And then when we got to the, the multi-class example, they added, uh, wh what type of estimator do you want to use? Macro, macro weighted, micro. And I, I don't fully understand the difference between those three, but I, I think they, they've got some good examples here. Multi-class is, is not my, my, uh, my, my domain knowledge. I don't think I've ever fit a, a multi-class model. So I was, I was definitely learning along as I, as I read this chapter. I thought this was pretty cool. So I'm gonna hop back over to the reference page here in, in Yardstick. The other thing they have are these curve functions and I, I didn't really get to talk about them too much, but there are some good plots in the book where uh, here are different ways to plot what we just saw. You know, we, we talked about sensitivity versus specificity. Some of these curves are just, here's the specificity on one axis and the, the sensitivity in the other axis and exactly how well does my model perform on, on, on this curve. And so there's a lot of plot functions that are built into Yardstick here like this RFC curve, rock curve, I don't, I don't really know the, the exact <laughs> pronunciation, but the, if, you, if you pipe a group by into this, this yardstick function, it, it facets it, it in, in uh, auto plot automatically. So this, I thought this was pretty cool. Uh, how to interpret a plot like this, you're, you're looking for the, the model that is the furthest uh, up into the left, the, the model that has the most area under the curve. And so what we're seeing here is this fold three, it looks like, you know, performs the best. It, it, it gains the most specificity. At the same time, it's losing, you know, the least, um, sorry, sensitivity while losing you know, a lower amount of specificity. And a model down here at the bottom, pink, you know, maybe nine or 10, uh, performs much worse. So if you were choosing between, you know, how did it, how did it look at all these different folds? it did much better on, on fold three than it did on fold 10. And it, you know, then to kind of plot how all of these look for each of the different classes, I think that's pretty cool. Rock, good to know. Also useful for, it, you know, when you're talking about picking different thresholds for deciding what class it is, you know, the rock curves can be used to balance sensitivity and specificity, what, you know, what is more important to you. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, can't remember if they, they talked about that in the chapter or not. Over different event thresholds. Yeah, uh, I, I talked a little bit about this earlier, but you know, in, in the model that I had here, you know, it's just it's using fifty percent. If it's over fifty percent, predict it as a one. If it's under, you can use this curve. I, I'm not entirely sure on the details. I'd, I'd have to look up a little bit more, but you can use this curve to help you pick a different threshold depending on on what you're you're trying to to optimize for. Um, one more thing I want to point out here in the chapter is this event level function. I have I have created these these curves, the the rock curves, and had them upside down, <laughs> where it looks like uh, it's the exact opposite of, of how it looks here. And I had to go back and and switch my event level. So this is kind of a cool thing they built into the the different metrics. Is you can choose which one is your your event of interest. And so 
it implicitly picks the the first one, I think. And so if you want to overwrite that, there's an option here in, in the different measures. FYI, it paused at some point again. Um, so I don't know why that is happening tonight. Hopefully it won't be too awful. Maybe it wasn't as long as I thought it was for the pauses, but um, yeah. Scott has some, some much better context than I could provide on the difference between between micro averages and mi macro averages. So I definitely recommend reading that. Yeah, so Scott said a macro average will compute the metric independently for each class and then take the average, hence treating all classes equally. Uh, whereas a micro average will aggregate the contributions of all classes to compute the average metric. And the weighted macro computes them independently, but weights them by number of observations rather than equally. That's usually better than regular macro when there are class imbalances. So yes, thank you very much, Scott. I, I found just reading the code a few times when he does it by hand for um, the, you know, the example in the book for sensitivity uh, did help. Like he, he doesn't really just, like he has a sentence about what each one means, but actually looking at how, you know, mean versus weighted mean versus sum over sum basically um, helped, I don't know, helped make it, make them make sense to me. I was just trying to put it in English. <laughs> yeah. It's also, it's helpful to have both for sure. Which can be a challenge for me at times. <laughs> right. Does anyone have any other questions from this chapter? Um, we're doing, looks like we're doing a pretty good job again of wrapping up right at the hour. Um, although this video won't reflect it because apparently it kept pausing randomly. Um, so just a reminder, because it might not be on video that uh, we're gonna do a Q and A next week. Um, we'll see if we get a bunch of people like in the meeting who watch the video and go, oh, wait, what? Um, we're gonna have a Q and A with Max and Julia. Um, so have your cues ready, uh, anything really, but, uh, the focus is this section chapter four through nine. That's, you know, the basics of building and testing a model. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, I would love to dig through your code a little more to see if we, but it looks like that was real. I didn't see anything else broken. So. Uh, I think those models just, you know, there wasn't enough difference probably to, to result in big differences, I guess. But. I tried to manufacture them. I, I tried models with a whole bunch of variables. I tried them with very few variables. That's I tried funny. them with all different ranges of, of penalties and hmm. things, and I could not I could not get to work differently. But. We'll have to dig in. Yeah. Still, yeah. All right. Well, we'll talk about it on the Slack. Um, we do need someone for Chapter 11, so kind of look at that and see if it looks like something you want to do. Um, and I will talk to you all, well, probably before next week, but also next week. So, see ya. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.